Good afternoon. This is the Core Conference Operator. Welcome and thank you for joining the ZNAM First Half 2020 Interim Results Conference Call. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Should anyone need assistance during the conference call, they may signal an operator by pressing star and zero on their telephone. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Marco Alvera, CEO of SNAM. Please go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to SNAM's 2020 interim results presentation. In terms of gas demand, there are a number of trends at play. The COVID-19 impact on a weather-adjusted basis is around 6.5% in the first half. As restrictive measures have been lifted, there are signs of recovery, in particular in the industrial sector. Turning to SNAM's performance in the first half, after the closure of most of our work sites, our CapEx program has now ramped back up to pre-COVID levels. We have started the pipeline replacement between Rimini and San Sepolcro and the public permitting process, the VIA process, on four large replacement projects, which are in the center of Italy and in Sicily have also started. Thanks to the significant efforts put in place by our people and our suppliers to restart work sites, the 100 million euro full year CapEx delay that we had forecast in April will, will now be in large part recovered before the year end. Our storage and LNG facilities provided ample flexibility to the system in a period of weak demand overall. In Panigalia, where we are revamping the second LNG tank, 31 LNG ships arrived in line with the strong performance of last year. With regards to the energy transition, we continue to grow our footprint with the acquisition of Iniziative Biometano, Mieci, and Devolve. On the international front, TAP is on track to start up in Q4. Despite COVID, work never stopped. The Southern Gas Corridor is now completely welded and commissioning activities are occurring on the Greek and Albanian sections, including already the introduction of hydrocarbons. We have concluded the regulatory review in Austria in line with our expectations, and in July, we closed the acquisition of a stake in Adnoc gas pipelines. We continue to optimize our financial structure. We launched the first Italian transition bond for 500 million euros. The bond was more than three times oversubscribed and 70% was allocated to ESG investors. The AGM approved the cancellation of around 34 million shares and authorized a new share buyback plan. In the first half, regulated revenues grew by 1.7% thanks to higher RAB, allowed DNA, and the inclusion of energy costs for 30 million euros. As you may recall, from this year, energy costs, which previously were addressed in kind, now contribute to revenues and costs with essentially no impact on EBITDA. Our EBITDA includes a COVID impact of around 6 million euros. This was a result of a lower commodity component in the revenues and higher costs from lower capitalizations mitigated by cost savings that exceeded the COVID-related OPEX. Our new businesses turned positive at the EBITDA level, notwithstanding continuous investment in the platform, the startups and the investments, and the slowdown in their activities in the second quarter. Net financial charges were 18 million euros lower than last year, and the contribution of associates was in line with the strong performance of last year excluding the one-off positive effect of 6 million that Terega booked last year. Net debt was up 8.4%, reflecting the alt acquisition, the payment of the dividend for the full year, and the buyback carried out in January and February. Working capital was negative this semester, with tariff-related impact items impacted by a change in the billing system mechanism, which we are working to normalize. Looking forward, given our solid first half results, a good outlook for our associates, favorable financial markets, and ongoing cost containment measures, we're now able to offset the expected COVID impact. And we can go back to the original guidance of one 
1.1 billion euros at the same perimeter, an improvement compared to the low single-digit percentage impact that we had forecasted at the Q1 results for net income. Moving to full-year net debt, we confirm our pre-COVID guidance of 12.4 billion, excluding the tariff working capital on a like-for-like basis, excluding acquisitions and any further buyback. All of our guidance, of course, is based on the assumption that there will be no further national lockdowns. Looking more closely at the Abu Dhabi deal, we are very pleased to have finalized an agreement with ADNOC, one of the largest energy companies in the world. The agreement is to acquire 49% of their gas pipeline assets in consortium with GIP, Brookfield, GIC, Ontario Teachers, and NH. This transaction was the result of a very competitive process. We were selected as the only industrial player in the process thanks to the recognition of our industrial and technical capabilities. The company has 20-year rights on the infrastructure that connects the upstream activities to Abu Dhabi's consumption points and export and interconnection terminals. We're investing $250 million with contracts backed by a AA counterpart in a strategic region with potential new opportunities both in natural gas and in the energy transition. In June, with the agreement for the acquisition of Miechi and Evolve, we have further strengthened our footprint in the energy efficiency sector. We entered this business through the acquisition of TEP in 2018. We have grown it organically and through bolt-on acquisitions such as TEA, a specialist in combined heat and power plants. We're now adding to the portfolio Miechi, which is focused on hospitals and public administration, and Volve, which offers energy efficiency solutions for buildings. With this step, we widen our range of services and clients, including the public administration, where there is significant potential. Energy efficiency is a key pillar of the energy transition and of the post-COVID recovery plan. In Italy, the government is very focused on this area and has just raised the tax deduction scheme to 110%, and this can be recovered over a five-year period. Overall, this remains still a very fragmented market with potential growth opportunities. Let's now turn to hydrogen, which continues to gain traction. On the policy front, the EU has finally launched its H2 strategy, targeting over 40 gigawatts of capacity by 2030, and a sector coupling policy. The EU strategy emphasizes a key role of gas networks to integrate renewables and the importance of coordination between the gas and electricity infrastructure. The EU strategy targets up to 470 billion euros of investment in hydrogen upstream, midstream, and downstream over the next 10 years. Many countries are now building their own plans with specific and ambitious targets. We have seen plans from Germany, Portugal, a consultation from Spain and the Netherlands and other countries are following suit. We're continuing to strengthen our leadership in this area. Together with 10 other TSOs, we've presented a vision for our European hydrogen backbone, a 23,000 kilometer network, which would connect nine European member states. This work would be 75% retrofit and 25% new build and would be able to guarantee flexibility and supply security at very low cost. In terms of asset readiness, we have recently tested a 10% hydrogen blend on a Baker Hughes turbine for the first time. This can compress and move hydrogen fuel blends through our transmission network of pipelines and also allow, allow us to use the same fuel to power ourselves. This uh, turbine will be installed at our compressor station of Istrana in the north of Italy in 2021. We are also working to develop uh, partnerships and pilot projects and looking for opportunities to invest in leading technologies along the hydrogen value chain. In the first half of 2020, we have also delivered sound progress across each of our ambitious ESG agenda items. We continue to reduce emissions on the environmental side. 
On the social side, during COVID crisis, we've played a strong role in the social response effort nationally. On governance, ESG KPIs are now enshrined in our remuneration plans. We confirm our strong commitment to ESG, which is at the center of everything we do. Thank you for your attention so far. I will now hand over to Alessandra. Thank you, Marco, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Adjusted EBITDA in the first half was 1 billion 107 million euro, down 4 million compared to the same period of the prior year. As Marco mentioned, from this year, the recognition of energy costs, which were addressed in kind until 2019, is included in the regulated revenues and cost lines, but remains essentially neutral at EBITDA level. The four in this slide, we have represented regulated revenues and other core items net of energy costs. The decrease of regulated revenues is due to a decrease of the commodity component year on year uh, of 15 million due to the volumes also related to COVID and as compared to a very strong year on volumes in 2019. Higher tariff rub and allowed DNA of 17 million compensated by a gradual reduction of input based incentives. The increase in core fixed cost of 3 million was mainly due to lower capitalization for 4 million related to the lockdown, partially offset by lower cost, mainly due to, to savings and COVID. On top of this, last year we benefited from the release of a pre-retirement fund for 2 million euro. In the first half, we have also benefited from lower accruals for 6 million euro, and the new businesses contributed positive for more than 1 million for the first time despite the, the slowdown suffered due to lockdown and continuous investment on the platform. We expect them to gain momentum in the second part of the year. Adjusted net profit in the first half 2020 was 578 million euro, essentially flat compared to last year. This was driven by the operating performance just commented, lower net interest expenses of 18 million euro Thanks to the full effect of the liability management executed in December, the natural bond rollover and treasury management optimization, and the OLT financial income. The slight decrease year on year of the contribution from associates, owning largely to the one off effect of 6 million related to uh, a tax release happening in 2019 in Terrega, TAG had instead a better performance, which compensated interconnected decrease. UK decrease and an ethyl gas decline due to a new regulation. The lower taxes are due to a decrease in earning before tax and the reintroduction of ACE. Cash from operation was 749 million euro, including 150 million of working capital absorption that includes 113 million of tariff related items. Also because now we receive some billing information from Acquirente Unico, which has temporarily lengthened the billing timeline, and 32 million of balancing activities. Cash flow from operation fully cover CapEx and CapEx payable, and partially financial investment outflows, mainly OLT, uh, and some uh, other uh, cash items uh, occurred in the first half. Other outflows for the period have been the dividend payment for 770 million, and the share buyback for 111 million carried out between January and February. This led to a net debt at the end of the semester of 12.9 billion. We confirm full year net debt guidance of 12.4 billion on a like for like basis and excluding working capital movement. We continue to expect negative working capital for approximately 0.1 billion as per our original guidance as we are working to normalize the billing delay described above. Being on a like-for-like -like basis, the net debt guidance does not, in, does not include the recent ADNOC acquisition and MIECE and EVOLVE for a total amount of approximately 300 million, and it doesn't include any further possible buyback. Let me now give you an update on the non debt structure. In the first quarter, as discussed, we secured 740 million of new term loans, and in June, we issued our first transition bond for 500 million at a cost of 0.75% and a tenor of 10 years. 
This brings our total sustainable financing instrument to approximately 6 billion, or about 40% of total committed facilities and bonds. As it regards to that breakdown, at the end of the first half, the fixed rate portion is in line with our three-quarter fixed to floating debt 2020 guideline, which we confirm. The maturity profile is well spread over time, and our liquidity profile remains strong with 3.2 billion of unrolled credit lines. Maturity of medium to long-term debt is circa 5.5 years in line with our target and as a result of liability management efforts executed in the first half of 2019 and longer tenor funding. With reference to share buyback program, in February we have concluded a repurchase tranche for 150 million executed under the original shareholder meeting authorization for, sorry, and we have obtained in June the approval for a new share buyback program for a maximum amount of 500 million uh, of uh, worth of, uh, of, of share. And we have also canceled in June at the AGM the cancellation of circa 34 million shares. We are now ready to take any questions you may have. Excuse me, this is the Corsco conference operator. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their telephone. To remove yourself from the question queue, please press star and two. Please pick up the receiver when asking questions. We ask participants to ask only two questions before returning to the queue. Management will take two participants' questions before answering. Anyone who has a question may press star and one at this time. We will pause for a moment as the callers join the queue. The first question is from Harry Weber of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking my uh, uh, questions. I'll stick to the regulation uh, two. So first one, clearly there are some things that have gone a little bit better um, in the first half of the year, I think, than you expected, so no, notably finance costs. And obviously, a, a lot of the COVID-induced uh, factors will not recur next year. So I wondered if, if you could just um, confirm that. I mean, does it, does it look, if we're thinking about next year, um, does it look like we're sort of going into next year with a slightly higher kind of base than, than you'd expected and that perhaps the outlook for 2021 has slightly improved? Um, and is there any way of, of, of trying to quantify uh, that or quantify what's, what's gone better than your expectation on a full year basis. Um, and then just a second one on, on M&A. So, so you've done ad not. How are you thinking about any, any further M&A? Is, is this going to lead to a, a, a pause now or do you still feel you have balance sheet headroom to do uh, further M&A deals? Any thanks? Okay. Thanks, Harry. So um, on the revenue side, uh, you, you know that uh, it's uh, not the full impact of the lower volumes is reflected in the Q1. So uh, you could almost extrapolate the six million that Ale uh, said is the first half impact almost linearly. So you could you think about a 10 million, perhaps 10, 11 million, 12 million overall impact for uh, 2020. You mentioned the better uh, financing uh, costs than we had at, uh, at the Q1. Um, kind of guidance adjustment, I would call it. And as I mentioned, some and Ali mentioned, some of our uh, associates are, are, are proving uh, resilient. So I wouldn't necessarily extrapolate to start in 2021 with a higher base, but we'll talk about 2021 in November when we when we look at the plan. Uh, regarding uh, M&A, uh, as always, we don't comment on on specific um, timing or, or opportunities ad hoc. We are very happy with. Uh, it's a relatively uh, small investment uh, in a very secure contractual framework. It's a very strategic uh, partnership that we're in, both with the financial investors and with ADNOC, and it's a key region that, as you may have seen, has announced the latest two records when it comes to uh, solar uh, costs. Uh, yesterday they announced a new auction at 11 and a half euros per megawatt hour which is, which is indeed a, a lot lower than many analysts uh, had anticipated. So it's not only a, a key hydrocarbon part of the world, but it's also 
uh, accelerating very fast the whole region on uh, and new uh, energies and the energy transition. So hopefully this is a, a, play, a starting point for, uh, for additional uh, opportunities and projects in the area. Regarding the headroom, uh, we've, we've mentioned previously we see 57.5% as our a reasonable uh, kind of upper limit, although technically speaking we could go as high as 60, but I'd like today to confirm the 57.5%. Okay, many thanks. Thank you. The next question is from Javier Suarez on Menu Banca. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you again uh, for uh, for taking uh, taking my questions. Uh, one is on the on the hydrogen the hydrogen opportunity. Uh, the question is when when the company is going to update us on in November on the on the business plan. Does the company intend to extend the length of, of the business plan uh, in terms of number of years to reflect that hydrogen opportunity? I'm, I'm, I'm asking this because I have the impression, uh, hearing from uh, other companies during the, the quarterly reporting, uh, that companies do, uh, do like, uh, uh, look at the hydrogen opportunity as a kind of a medium-term thing when I, I have the impression that maybe uh, a company like, uh, like your company will have to accelerate on, on CapEx to be an enabler of that opportunity. Do you think that that is a fair statement? That's the first, the first question. Uh, the second question is on your conversations with the Italian energy regulator. You can update us on, on any uh, potential uh, development of the possibility of giving some remuneration for the fully depreciated assets with a regulation kind of mirroring uh, the one that Spain has. And the, and the third question is on the, on the simplification decree. Um, uh, it seems that the government intends to accelerate the uh, the, the gasification of Sardinia, if you can, uh, you can help us to understand how that could be affecting your, your business plan. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Javier, for your question. On the first point, I think if you, if you look back at last year's plan, we were already giving a long-term outlooks for the growth in the RAB, which remains a significant part of, of what's driving the rest of the plan. Uh, I saw uh, other people, too, go out to 2030, uh, we're, we're still um, drafting the plan. What we may do, like we did before, is give some flashes on the outer years, but the plan will, will remain uh, in the same in the same time horizon with the uh, with the granularity that you are used to seeing. But we will try to provide as much guidance as we have. Please keep in mind that uh, as Europe has just begun to really address its its hydrogen policy. Uh, it will still be too early in November to be able to give the full detail of how the network uh, and the networks across Europe uh, will develop, but certainly there is a very significant uh, opportunity uh, out there, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, sec on your second question, we really like, as you know, the Spanish regulation when it comes to fully amortized assets. We have had a number of encouraging exchanges with our own regulator, and we are in discussions, and we hope by your end to have some news uh, to, to be able to share with you. Regarding your third question, the simplification degree, uh, it's very positive that Sardinia is in there. I wouldn't read it necessarily as a sign that Sardinia is the top uh, of the list, but it's very good to have Sardinia there. Overall, the effort the government is trying to push ahead with is to streamline the authorization process right now we have projects that can take uh, above five years to get the VIA, the final VIA, uh, which I mentioned we have initiated already for some of our own replacements. Uh, the idea is rather than going in series and having one ministry after the other give the okay, which leads to significant lead times, uh, we would like, and the government is following us and, and, and other companies' advice on this to, to try to move it into a situation where you start with the permitting process in parallel so that you don't have any lead times or you, you minimize the lead times. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's a good sign. Let's, it's gone through one chamber. Let's see how the final law comes out. But certainly it's, it's a step in the right direction, as I've mentioned before. Thanks, Sylvia. Thank you. The next question is from Jean-Pierre Bonnet on Menu yeah, good afternoon. Um, just two questions. The first one is um, regarding the EU hydrogen strategy. I mean, my key takeaway is basically that um, 
the document is talking about the availability of the energy infrastructure um, for hydrogen, kind of calling a semi-public uh, service. Um, I was wondering, in your uh, conversations with this or your agreement with this 10 TSOs in Europe, um, how are you going to anticipate demand? I mean, what is the time uh, when you have to start investing? Because, I mean, clearly the, the idea is that you have to anticipate, you have to make available the infrastructure before demand is there. And the second question uh, is related to a big debate um, among macroeconomists regarding inflation and deflation. If, if you can share a little bit of your views, uh, I mean, going forward, what is your expectations of uh, the deflator in Italy to go up or, or down? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Juan Luis. So on the European hydrogen strategy, what they've done to address the issue that you raise, uh, which is the usual uh, chicken and egg issue with, uh, with energy infrastructure, they have built a hydrogen alliance where they have um, the trying to put together the supply and the demand around the same table. What we think is that there will be uh, an early stage, which is going to be mainly about clusters uh, developing, and, and the issue will be how to supply those clusters with hydrogen. These will be, let's say, subsidized clusters where logistics will not be optimized, and there can be some movement of hydrogen on trucks and some dedicated uh, small pipelines uh, around those clusters and some electrolyzer capacity around those clusters. Then there's going to be an intermediate phase where the, from clusters you move to hubs and regions. There we can uh, see an early stage of development of dedicated uh, pipes as well as freeing up some of the current pipes used for methane uh, to create dedicated capacity. And blending can play a role in this intermediate phase. The role of blending will be a function of the membranes and of some of the experiments that we are carrying on, that, that we're leading the way on, such as the one with Baker Hughes I mentioned and the one we did uh, earlier um, in the year and last year with the 5 and 10% blending uh, down in, in southern Italy. Uh, the um, 10 TSOs have uh, joined forces. Uh, there is ample scope for CapEx in the plan that we proposed. I think it goes from around 27 to 64 billion euros. Keep in mind that we think, as I mentioned, that 75% of the steel is hydrogen ready. So it's not so much a question of the steel in the pipes itself. It's more a question of the stations, the compressors, uh, the, um, the, the forks that we need to build to separate eventually. And really the key, key question for all of this remains the storage, uh, where we still don't know if we can go into the existing reservoirs with uh, blending and at what, per, what percentage we, we can go there. So I think Europe is approaching it the right way. If we think about how the gas industry started, we didn't have the luxury of this kind of concerted alliance and this kind of effort to design a system that makes sense for all stakeholders. And we also have a very significant uh, state uh, money uh, of different sorts at play between the European Green Deal and the recovery funds and the just transition mechanisms. So there's also a lot of capital available out there to smoothen out the bumps that inevitably uh, happen when you, when you really start an industry from scratch. The good news is that everyone is, is in, in full execution mode. All the players we talk to are, are thinking about building hydrogen business units inside their organizations. There's a strong uh, team across Europe that is emerging. We're involved in, in many of the panels and debates and, and uh, meetings with the, our government, other governments, and the European Union. So I think we're moving in, in the right direction, and I think Europe is really going to lead uh, the way on this. When it comes to your second question, the outlook that we read about in the papers and in the forward curves is, is more uh, deflationary than inflationary, so we don't expect an increase in our deflator uh, going forward, but again, we'll continue to monitor what the uh, macroeconomists think and what the forward curves are, and we'll update you on this in November. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Enrico Bartoli of Maine First. Please go ahead. 
Hi, good afternoon. First of all, taking my question. The first one is regarding uh, ad hoc. You mentioned that uh, this uh, disagreement, uh, this JV, could uh, provide the opportunity for additional uh, business uh, uh, development in, uh, in the area. If you can uh, elaborate a bit on this, if you think that there is the opportunity to be involved uh, in the management of uh, other pipeline, gas pipeline networks, or you are thinking also about uh, other businesses. A second one is just a clarification on uh, what, what you said about the potential uh, in terms of capex in uh, the development of this uh, hydrogen uh, uh, European grid. You mentioned this uh, 27, 64 billion euros. I guess that mainly this is for a European level. What do you think that uh, could be uh, the, the potential for, for SNAM within, uh, within this project? And the last one is regarding the new buyback program. If you have already some visibility on uh, if and when uh, it would be activated in case in the, in the second half of the year. Thank you. Thanks, Enrico. So I don't want to create expectations uh, in the Middle East, but certainly it's an area where they are very attracted to what we are doing in CNG and in small-scale LNG. They have a lot of uh, their own uh, gas uh, resources, and uh, they see an opportunity to use gas, which they can sell at a much uh, lower uh, margin, uh, and this is true for many countries in that region, than they can sell uh, diesel or oil at globally uh, to use uh, that gas domestically, uh, both in cars, CNG, and, and in trucks. And um, there's also, of course, an opportunity in hydrogen. Today, in the region, like in uh, most countries in the world, uh, the electricity and solar projects are completely disconnected from the molecules. And as they have led the world with these recent uh, record-breaking uh, big capacity auctions, it's two gigawatts for this one, and I think it was a similar size for the previous one, the opportunity to turn some of this electricity, especially they will have a lot of excess renewable uh, in, in, the very, um, in the very warm, uh, very sunny days, uh, turn some of that into hydrogen for domestic use to again, free up the export potential, I think, is a common thread. So, you know, we have the SNAM Global Solutions, which is targeting NOCs uh, to uh, sell our own capabilities and technologies and services. So the opportunities are a little bit about around SNAM Global Solutions, and partnering with ADNOC gives us uh, a footprint in the whole region, uh, as well as uh, trying to develop some of our energy transition uh, startups, uh, giving them an, a window onto that part of the world. Regarding the third question, um, sorry, the, your second question was around the hydrogen capex and the and the 10-year and the 10 TSO plan. As I mentioned, the flagship, the, the high-level capex opportunity is between 27 and 64 billion. That's what's been identified in our work with Navigant. This is overall. Uh, we have a share of that, which is below our share of, let's say, natural gas transported in Europe. So if, if we have a 20-something percent share of the European gas market, our share of that capex is below uh, our, our share of, of gas uh, because our network is, is quite ready, actually, and, uh, and some of the replacements that we have to do, we have to do anyway, regardless of, of hydrogen or not. Uh, but we'll try to give you as much clarity as we can uh, in November. Uh, regarding uh, buybacks, as you know, we don't uh, give um, guidance on uh, on our buyback initiatives, so you'll have to uh, follow us to, to see what we end up doing. Thanks, Enrico. Thank you. The next question is from Stefano Gamberini of Equitas Sim. Please go ahead. Sorry, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, three questions, if I may. Uh, the first regarding uh, uh, your cap explaining for coming years. If I'm not wrong, uh, during an interview on a, on a press, uh, you said that uh, you can add one billion capex uh, in your current business plan if uh, some um, changes in the authorization process uh, uh, should arrive from, from the government. I don't know if we, in the simplification decree these changes arrive, just to understand if uh, we can expect an acceleration in the next years uh, due to this uh, um, situation. The second two questions, if I may, on, on the hydrogen. The first, if I'm not wrong, uh, the role of uh, uh, renewables are very important for the development of green hydrogen. So. 
Are you already in talk with Teana in order to uh, have a, a, a joint development of uh, uh, renewables uh, in order to uh, to be an enabler of uh, hydrogen growth in Italy or not? And do you think that this could be uh, a sort of uh, way to follow in order to accelerate the process? And uh, the second, uh, regarding the different uh, features for the utilization of hydrogen, if I'm not wrong, transportation and uh, power gen should be the most important. Uh, what are, in your view, uh, the, 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 the real um, trigger that could accelerate uh, the uh, hydrogen in the next years uh, uh, from the transportation, from the power gen, from industry, from heating? I don't know. What do you expect about that? Thank you. So, uh, Stefano, I think you're referring to uh, a comment I made as uh, we were debating the Stati Generali, which is when the government uh, called uh, a lot of the big companies to uh, provide ideas. And in that context, we were uh, giving an example of, um, the, in the context of saying, if instead of five years, it could take only a few months, like it should take, to get authorizations on very simple projects, this could lead to a one billion acceleration. So it was very simply taking our 10-year plan and bringing forward some of the projects that we have in the outer part of the 10-year plan into the five-year plan. Uh, so let's say it was a, a kind of a, an academic exercise. I unfortunately do not expect that we will be able to get permitting done so fast. I do expect that there will be some improvements, as I mentioned earlier in the uh, Decreto Semplificazioni, as it becomes law. Uh, but I don't expect that order of magnitude, unfortunately, to follow through from the same, let's say, perimeter. Um, we will provide details of the plan in November. Directionally, I expect and, and hope the plan uh, will provide for some new activities, and so I don't expect any decrease uh, compared to the previous plan, and hopefully we will be able to have some element of the, uh, reg not regulatory, of the legal uh, framework uh, that provides for some acceleration. Uh, regarding hydrogen, we are indeed spending uh, quite a lot of time with Terna, as we've done uh, last year and the year before, uh, trying to come up with joint scenarios. This is very precious work uh, that we're doing for the energy system in the country. Joint scenarios are really the only way to, to have a plan at the national level and to go forward with that plan. Uh, we are not at this point talking about uh, anything on the uh, renewables uh, side. On the uh, third question that you had as to the trigger of utilization, we consider hydrogen in the long run to be extremely effective in all the hard-to-abate sectors. These are heavy transport, as you mentioned. This is true for trains, buses, trucks, airplanes, ships eventually. Uh, in uh, heating that you've mentioned, in uh, heavy industry, mainly steel and other industries, and then uh, also in, uh, in power gen. The trigger is going to be a policy uh, push. We see the market as being ready for hydrogen trucks. Uh, you see some excitement with some public stocks focusing on hydrogen trucks, and all the big uh, truck manufacturers are putting hydrogen at the center of their energy transition strategy. I think before heating and power gen, it will be industry. We see the German hydrogen plan being explicit about steel and some of the words coming out of the German energy minister being quite strong uh, around steel, also regarding Italian steel. We've heard languages coming out of uh, the vice president of Europe, Franz Timmermans, talking specifically about hydrogen and steel. So I think there can be some acceleration due to policy um, initiatives around heavy transport and industry. Heating will take a little while longer because of the complexity of bringing hydrogen into people's homes, but that's where hydrogen is most needed because of the seasonality factor that no other renewable technology uh, can account for except biomethane, which may not have enough volumes uh, for the whole of heating. Cars will come after trucks because of the uh, complexity of building out the network, and it will take uh, more time, uh, but they will eventually also come for long-range uh, cars. And power gen is, again, a question of how to 
uh, transform the hydrogen back into electricity? Will it be hybrid turbines like the ones we've uh, been testing with Baker Hughes at the Nuovo Pignone in Florence? Will it be uh, fuel cells? Uh, it's probably going to be a combination of the two. Again, the key question there is storage. And as we look at storage, the cost advantage of hydrogen storage versus battery storage is, is quite significant uh, for mobile use and also for stationary use. So thanks for your questions. The next question is from Olivier van Dosselaar of Exxon. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, good afternoon, and, and thank you for taking our um, questions. Uh, first one uh, will, will be on, on hydrogen again. Um, coming back a little bit to stuff that you said before, but by, well, when we look towards 2030 and, and those 40 gigawatts of electrolyzer that will be built, what do you think will be the, the biggest source of consumption from the hydrogen coming out of that? Will it be parts of you know, dedicated industries and, 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 and sectors that would, that would be fueled fully on, on, on that hydrogen? Or do you think it will mainly be uh, the blending of the hydrogen in the existing gas network uh, as sort of a source to enable the upscaling of production in this first phase? Uh, and, then, and then linked to that, who do you expect would be um, operating the, the electrolyzers and, and, and actually commercializing the, uh, the, the hydrogen? What kind of players will that be? Industrial, so will it be utilities, or, or are you thinking about others? Um, and then uh, a second one just on, uh, on, on ADNOC. I was hoping if you could maybe give us an indication. Uh, sorry if you've done it this already and, and I have missed it, but if you could give an indication on what you expected the PNL contribution to be from, a, uh, from that stage, that would be a great. Thank you. So, um, so on hydrogen, the, the demand will be um, in transport, as I mentioned. This will be uh, relatively easy because on heavy transport, you don't need as many fueling points. And if you look carefully at the statements, public statements of some of the CEOs of, of trucking companies, they're talking about 30 or 40 percent of trucks produced in 2030 in Europe to be hydrogen trucks. So there's going to be a big uh, demand uh, coming out of uh, trucking. On um, the industrial side, there will be clusters you can see in the north of Europe, and uh, we're working on some ideas in the south of Europe to have some aggregation. The aggregation is necessary to keep the logistics costs at the minimum and to get the markets uh, going and uh, and and then I mentioned over a longer period of time you will go from clusters uh, to to regional hubs but that will take uh, a longer period of time already in 2025 there will be um, the need to have significant infrastructure if we are to meet the 2030 targets both of the hydrogen agenda and let's always remember that we still don't have national plans that are consistent with the 55 percent. CO2 reduction for 2030. So that in itself will require a lot of uh, hydrogen uh, penetration uh, in, in European countries. When it comes to uh, who will operate the electrolyzers, uh, I think there will be many different types of electrolyzers. There will be large electrolyzers next to large uh, solar and wind um, farms, and, and uh, there will be medium-sized electrolyzers around the transmission uh, networks, and there will also be opportunity to develop smaller scale electrolyzers. Uh, of course, the smaller you go, the more um, efficiency you lose, and um, also the further down the electricity grid you go, the more system costs you have on that electricity that you want to transform into hydrogen. But there is such a uh, s such a big market out there that there will be uh, multiple types of electrolyzers, the same way there will be multiple types of fuel cells. There will be big fuel cells and very small fuel cells. The beauty of the fuel cell, by the way, is that you can already start running some of these kits with natural gas. And so today you can already replace uh, a normal uh, heat pump with a fuel cell with a spectacular uh, energy savings, running it on methane, and that fuel cell is ready to then uh, run on natural gas. So we see opportunity from our energy efficiency business eventually to start uh, selling uh, customers, uh, selling fuel cells to customers that run on gas and then 
can switch to uh, can switch to uh, hydrogen. Uh, regarding ADNOC, uh, there will be um, a cash yield, which is uh, quite a, you know, it's it's, it's uh, attractive to what we have in our international portfolio, uh, which is uh, uh, I'm not sure I should say the details of number, but it's, it's uh, let's say north of 15 million euros on the dividend side. And uh, the net income contribution should be uh, around the number I mentioned. So expect a higher uh, cash contribution than a net income contribution because of the uh, transaction uh, structure and the leverage that we have on this deal. Thank you very much. Thanks, Olivia. The next question is from Antonella Bianchetti of CG. Please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you for taking my question. I have just uh, a big picture question on the future hydrogen strategy and so on and so forth. So Europe is talking about energy efficiency, electrification, and even the most bullish estimates on hydrogen consumption in 2050 points to a number which is one-third of today uh, gas consumption. So my question is, I totally understand that the opportunity of hydrogen is a diversification of something, that, but I'm still worried about the legacy assets of, uh, of the gas assets because uh, demand or hydrogen or gas, whatever is going to be, is massively declining while your rub is growing. How do you think uh, this? could be sustainable, how you can, uh, um, you know, who's going to pay for it. And the other question is, uh, um, do you have already an idea of uh, how much, how, which is the percentage of your network that could be repurposed for uh, hydrogen, not only technically, but also in terms of uh, proper utilization of this network? Because obviously the network is completely different in terms of design compared to a potential future uh, European uh, uh, hydrogen network. And my last question is, uh, you expect the hydrogen uh, network in Europe to be a regulated asset, and uh, who's going to pay for it uh, in, uh, uh, in, during the time in which the hydrogen market is, uh, is developing, or you are willing to take some uh, commercial uh, risk on this uh, development? Thank you. Thank you, Antonella, for your, your good question. So uh, when it comes to looking at um, stranded assets and, and what happens to the network in 2050, we need to look at Italy and uh, carefully. And we've provided, as you remember in the past, a stress test saying we need 100% of our network, even with volumes as low as 35 BCM uh, of gas. Now, um, uh, and we need 100% of the network. So this means zero stranded uh, parts of the network in 2050. Uh, actually, that, that scenario was done even in 2040 at 35, which is significantly below what we have with Terna as our joint scenario, which assumes more or less a stable uh, gas demand out to 2040. Uh, as we look at replacing gas with hydrogen, you need more volumes of hydrogen to have the same calorific power as uh, natural gas. So as we look at the long-term strategy for Italy, uh, which has been uh, shared in a draft format and is in the process of being uh, sent to Brussels or updated, it's in, in, in the process of, of being discussed, which is not based on any import of hydrogen, uh, we, we see volumes of, call it around 10 million tons, which we think is uh, significantly underestimated because of the lack of import. And then we see volumes of biomethane of similar size, around 10 billion cubic meters. That already gets us in 2050 very close to that 35 uh, BCM. So as we, as we project forward um, uh, our network uh, use, uh, we, we need it all. But more importantly, if you look at the German uh, hydrogen strategy, they will need, and they have stated that they will need, very significant hydrogen imports. And if you look at the progress that we are making in Italy and that Germany is making in Germany in building out renewables, 
we will need to outsource a lot of the renewable development to where we can execute this. So we see a significant opportunity for Italy to become a hub, not the only hub, but a hub for imports, and it will, will not all be based on imports. Uh, so we see opportunity to significantly increase the outlook for hydrogen compared to what is in, let's say, last year's uh, long-term strategy draft. So under any uh, circumstance, even the most um, aggressive electrification and reduction of um, molecules, we still need uh, all the network because I'm coming now to your, the second part of your question. It is 10 times cheaper uh, to move uh, molecules, renewable molecules around than it is to move renewable electrons around. And it is 20 times cheaper to store uh, renewable molecules than it is to store renewable electrons. So as you look at the merit order of our infrastructure compared to any other uh, competing infrastructure in the short, medium, and long term, the, the advantages are quite clear. So again, we're happy to share more about this in November and, uh, and keep you updated as the European strategy evolves. Uh, I don't know if it will be regulated or contracted. What I do know is that nowhere in the world uh, any midstream infrastructure has ever been built uh, without contracted uh, offtake capacity. So uh, as we have shown with TAP and ADNOC, uh, sometimes we even prefer to have uh, long-term contracts uh, compared to regulation because it, uh, it provides for the same uh, certainty of, of offtake without... Uh, regulatory review periods uh, in between. Thanks, Antonella. The next question is from A.K. Becker of Verve Team. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you very much for taking my question. And one more, uh, continuing on the hydrogen theme, if you don't mind. And um, for, on your comment of um, exports and imports, on a European level, how do you see this developing? Do you see the hydrogen being the produced mainly in Europe and then transported around Europe from the production hubs? Or do you see scope for imports of hydrogen into Europe, for example, from, from the low-cost production hubs in the Middle East? Thank you. This is a great question. So. A solar panel in Abu Dhabi, we say, costs 11 euros per megawatt hour. A solar panel in Central Europe can cost today three to four times that. Of course, costs are coming down everywhere, but it will be uh, much more efficient to import uh, hydrogen. The cost of liquefying hydrogen or creating ammonia from hydrogen and then transforming that ammonia back into hydrogen is very expensive. So wherever there is a pipeline potential, and this is the same as was the case with natural gas many years ago, wherever there is a pipeline potential, there will be uh, significant imports of hydrogen. Uh, there will be also imports of blue hydrogen for sure. Some environmentalists consider blue hydrogen a detriment to green hydrogen. We think there should be at least a period of time when there is technological neutrality so that the hydrogen downstream and midstream infrastructure can be developed and we can then in 20, 30, 40, and 50 uh, begin to phase out blue if we have enough green. Uh, so there will be significant imports of hydrogen into Europe uh, simply because of what I said before. And if you look at the numbers of the ambition that we have in terms of gigawatts we need to build in Europe to get to 55% reduction and the progress that we are making, not because of regulation, not because of laws, but because of local opposition to some renewable projects uh, in inside Europe, uh, the plan is indeed to import big volumes. And because of Italy's proximity to North Africa, because of the advantages of, of installing solar infrastructure in North Africa, because of the uh, preparedness of North Africa, even if from the outside it could look like an unstable part of the world, we have had as, as SNAM and other companies uh, many decades of successful um, technical, industrial, and, and commercial uh, relationships with some of these countries that have been uh, exporting energy to Italy uh, for many decades. So uh, thanks for that question. I think it's going to be a combination of uh, domestically uh, produced hydrogen, uh, locally produced hydrogen, regionally as well as internationally produced hydrogen for Europe. Thank you. 
Thank Just you. Just a reminder, if you wish to register for a question, please press star 1 on your telephone. For any further questions, please press star 1 on your telephone. Mr. Alvera, there are no more questions registered at this time. Okay. I'd like to thank everyone for the attention and the questions. A lot of questions on hydrogen. We look forward to continuing to talk over the coming weeks and months and, uh, and to seeing you all at our update in November. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining. The conference is now over. You may disconnect your telephones. Thank you.